cancer de novo next slide please next now the key thing is this diagram and this you need to remember and if you know this diagram you would never have any problems we have urothelium which has mucosa submucosa and lamina propria next slide so anything which is in the mucosa is your t 1 a ta cancer so ta which is not gone into submucosa is this is submucosa and anything which is into submucosa is t1 this is t1 t1 extends from mucosa up to the lamina propria so this is lamina propria and if we go beyond lamina propria you have detrusor muscle and this becomes your t2 cancer then you have some flat lesions which are called carcinoma in situ next slide please this is a very well known diagram the extension of tumor from the bladder to going to the muscles and from muscles into the serosa and from serosa into adjoining organs we know that uh, depending upon its t stage the survival varies significantly you have a very bad survival for high stage cancers in very good survival in well maintained patients who have ta or t1 lesion and again at that point the most important determinant factor of survival is in a ta or t1 cancer the grade right so if you have a ta low grade cancer it would be the same survival as somebody who does not have a bladder cancer but if it is high grade it's an it's a it's a bad disease even if it is ta high grade it's as bad as t1 g3 or t1 high grade next slide please this is how it typically looks like but sometimes it can be next these flat lesions which are difficult to diagnose called the carcinoma in situ if it is it's, it's visible clearly or we lower down the lights is it it's okay okay next slide please TRBT, which is a cornerstone in the management of bladder cancer, is standardized procedure, and this standardization is maintained very clearly with good level of evidence in literature, and these are from the European Association last year's guidelines. It's important that uh, you do examination under anesthesia, which is simply means that you put your finger in the rectum or vagina. and uh, try and see what's the stage of the by this time you have only done an ultrasound and nothing else so you wish to know how bad the disease is and this information can subsequently come to you after histopathology and ct scan but if you know at this point that you're dealing with something which is not within the layers of the bladder and has gone beyond then uh, you would start preparation of this patient maybe one of the preparation would be to take biopsy from the pericolicular area uh, in order to see if this patient can underwent uh, orthotopic bladder next slide please majority of your patients are going to have repeated cystoscopies so those who have non muscle invasive cancer will undergo cystoscopies for the next 10 years and you would not remember where you have resected the previous tumor so a small bladder diagram if your hospital keeps record that's wonderful and we are very fortunate that these records are available of last last time cystoscopy if your hospital does not maintain records then you should do it on your own so maybe a piece of paper to the patient describing where the tumor was or maybe some own, own, your own record and where you have taken the biopsies from so bladder diary is absolutely essential majority of tumor if they recur they will recur very close to from where you have resected these tumors previously next slide please now difficult situation number 1 we have been taught that oncology and cancer management is by isolating the tumor from the surrounding normal tissue so that there is no spillage of uh, of tumor cells in the surrounding area and we have a clear situation but this is something that we don't do we don't do it for our turbts
ओके इसमें आपको क्लिक करना होगा स्लाइड पे इससे इससे नहीं होगा ना ओके सो दिस इज टिपिकल टी आर बेटी दैट यू डू एवरी डे एंड दिस इज एग्जैक्टली वॉट यू शुड नॉट बी डूइंग वाई अफीज दिस इज हाउ यू डू टी आर बेटी एंड दिस इज नॉट हाउ यू शुड बी डूइंग इट वाई बाबर बाबर राइट एज वन पीस या so this is all all of you this is the way you do it yeah okay now this is what you are doing who is this tiger wood so obviously it's a very good hit you all guys are tiger wood you are tiger wood when you are holding a receptoscope but uh, what we are doing wrong is this we are spilling all that turf all around and these are tumor cells and they can get incorporated at any point in the bladder where there is a denuded mucosa and there would be a lot of places where there would be denuded mucosa prostatic fossa urethra areas of bladder we have taken a random biopsy and that's why about 10 15 years back single installation of mitomycin c was introduced so something that you had still into the bladder immediately after surgery preferably within the first 6 hours and uh, there was a big meta analysis by silvester which showed that uh, you would decrease the chances of early recurrence significantly and you know all know that if you have perforation uh, or bleeding you cannot stop irrigation you can't put mitomycin so these are some of the condition that you would avoid uh, as you said that if it is a small tumor you can use your resectoscope and cut it on um, block one piece right or if it is very small tiny little one you can just pluck it with your uh, forceps uh, cold forceps and uh, bug be that area or, or do cystofulgration now this is another way of doing a sorry and they have been increasing talk about oh Okay, here, here. Okay, okay, okay. Thanks. So, this is another recent way I described about doing a TURBT. Now, I am using a Collins knife, and this Collins knife is first of all marking the boundaries of this relatively small tumor. Uh, we have started, and this is the laryngeal mask. so whenever you say that it's the patient is going to go home same day they would not uh, intubate that patient and give laryngeal mask and you start seeing the anatomy of the bladder you start seeing the muscles which pathologists don't see so you send them and you you have seen it yourself but pathologists say that no muscle tissue available blending phase no cut phase so the first step is that uh, <clears throat> you mark the periphery of the tumor and once you have marked the periphery of the tumor then you start to uh, resecting it further so i'm just going to expedite this a little bit so once you have marked the periphery the lady is coming the lady keeps coming back <laughs> this may be a dilemma this may be a good thing so now the principle of this surgery has actually come from the experience of pit surgical procedure introduced in the last 12 15 years this is the same principle that we will demonstrate in the second half of the procedure yeah so when we do it you are bt or trp this is what we are known this is what we move actively right now passive movement is something that we have learned from our experience in laser surgeries because in laser surgery you go to the core and lift the adenoma or tumor up so once you have done that you go all around and then you try to lift this tumor from the base and uh, and remove it completely thoda sa isko aage badha de
अरे यार तुम तो मुझसे भी ज्यादा होशियार निकले और 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 आगे यहां तक ले आइए ओके ओके एनी हाउ लीव इट सो इट्स इट्स वेरी सिंपल यू गो इन टू द बेस यू कीप कटिंग इट यू लिफ्ट द ट्यूमर अप एंड दिस इज व्हाट आई वांटेड टू शो यू लिफ्ट द ट्यूमर अप एंड वंस यू स्टार्ट लिफ्टिंग इट अप it you can see the base of the tumor you keep fulgurating that base and the whole tumor comes out in one piece now if it's a small tumor uh, you can actually elicate out in one piece theek hai rehne dijiye and this is an elegant surgical procedure with a with a little base of the turf where tumor was has been removed so you al can elicate out the whole thing in one piece and this is the tumor floating in your uh, evacuator and this is how it looks like so it's it's one piece what is the advantage that potentially we have not spill any tumor cysts the second difficult situation is carcinoma in situ and carcinoma in situ is is a real problem uh this is a cystoscopy picture i have shown it many times so you don't see anything abnormal in this picture right and you see the blue light cystoscopy and you can see there is tumor here just underneath the ureteric orifice and this is on blue light cystoscopy same here tumor which was not visible on white light is visible here on the blue light cystoscopy okay uh, turn it on video वीडियो पे कर्सर आप करें वो हाँ तो इसको फास्ट फॉरवर्ड हो सकती है दिस इज नाउ द ट्यूमर विच हैज बीन रिसेक्टेड इन वेरियस एरियाज एंड वेन यू डू अ ब्लू लाइट सिस्टोस्कोपी यू विल स्टार्ट सींग न्यू एरियाज ऑफ ट्यूमर एंड मोस्ट ऑफ दीज एरियाज आर एक्चुअली वेरी क्लोज टू द ट्यूमर दैट यू हैव रिसेक्टेड सो दिस पेशेंट हैड अ बिग ट्यूमर इन वेरियस एरियाज समथिंग लाइक दिस विच वॉज नॉट विजिबल Uh, clearly on a white light but it is visible now even a papillary growth not just carcinoma in situ that papillary growth is visible on your blue light cystoscopies so this is a potential advantage of this modality and carcinoma in situ when it is itself is a pretty deadly condition uh, can be picked up early with this we know it can be done with uh, either hexa minolevulinic acid or a penta minolevulinic acid increases sensitivity uh, but not really specificity to that extent because there are so many conditions which can mimic uh, carcinoma in situ on blue light cystoscopies and they may not be uh, tumors uh, there are various types of uh, carcinoma in situ primary secondary concurrent or recurrent and these are all very familiar definitions of these things intravesical bcg is the standard of treatment and there is good quality evidence available and uh, very vigilant uh, cystoscopies and post operative care is required if it the bcg fails you should go ahead and do a cystectomy earlier than later because this is a deadly condition it can metastasize the question about random biopsies do all of you take random biopsies during your turbts no what is the disadvantage of taking a random biopsy you are potentially uh, exposing uh, epithelium which can get incorporated with the tumor cells floating around in the bladder right so random biopsies there are clear recommendations of when they should be taken and you should always take a random biopsies if you have a cytology positive do all of you do cytologies before your flexible uh, before your check cystoscopies now this is a mandatory thing cytology before a uh, cystoscopy is mandatory and you should always do it because it can actually be an additional advantage <clears throat> you would not pick up low grade cancers and you'd miss if you do a cytology and you find that the cytology is positive and you don't see anything you probably have either an upper tract uh <clears throat> if you have an upper tract abnormality or 
if there is a situation in which there is carcinoma in situ. Situation number four, which is doing second TUR. All of you know when second TUR should be done. Rehan? So you have a pathology report saying that uh, a high grade tumor invading lamina propria, no muscle seen. What is the stage? TX. Good. So it's TX, meaning not staged. So then you will do a redo, which is should be done ideally in two to six weeks time. And you take muscle and try and make sure that you're not dealing with uh, uh, muscle invasive cancer. What about tumors which are close to the ureteric orifice? What do you do in a situation like this? You leave it, you resect it boldly, or uh, ask somebody to come and do it, or schedule a patient when you are not around so that it, the blame doesn't come on you if there is an obstruction of the kidney. So that's a difficult situation. Now, if, if you uh, resect the ureteric orifice and you do it with a cutting current, there would not be a significant harm. So you can do it and it would be all right in a few days time. But you need to do a functional study to make sure that there is no significant long-term obstruction. Now what I do is that, uh, yeah, start the video. Now this patient had a tumor very close to the ureteric orifice and it is about to come. It is here. So that's a ureteral orifice. It's very close. And when you're cutting this tumor, you're actually cutting on the intramural part of the ureter. The rest of the procedure is the same. You're marking all around and then you're going into the base and you start lifting and you start cutting those fibers. This is just like dissecting a tumor as you would do for an open surgical or a robotic surgical procedures. And you use this as your retractor to push the tumor and uh, cut it whenever it's necessary. See how deep we have gone. We are actually uh, clearly seeing the muscle fibers and uh, this whole tumor is. Now this is the ureteric orifice. Can you see that? So you've done it very, very close and uh, you have actually shaved over the intramural ureter but it's safe if you use a uh, cutting current. What about tumor in the diverticulum? That's a difficult situation, right? So this is a patient and you can all see this IVU, X-ray, diverticulum. This is not my patient. Uh, this is a diverticulum on the left lateral wall. This somehow is not working. This is a CT scan. You can see that diverticulum with uh, Tumor inside. This is a diverticulum and not the ureter. And this is how it looked like. So, what will you do in a situation? Now, the problem with diverticulum is that if you resect deep, and that's what you should do to remove the whole tumor, you will perforate. And if you resect superficially, you will leave the tumor behind and you would not be able to stage the disease. You don't really need to. Do you need to stage disease as muscle invasive in a diverticulum? No, you don't, because there is no muscle. Right? It's only a mucosal outpouching, uh, all the secondary or non-congenital acquired diverticulum. Video Now the first thing that you need to do in a diverticulum, this is a diverticulum, small mouth, a small opening. Uh, you look around to make sure that there is no other disease. The first thing that I do is to open this diverticulum up. So you resect the margin of the diverticulum so that your narrow neck diverticulum becomes a wide neck diverticulum. And once you have a wide neck diverticulum, then you would uh, uh, resect this. The uh, advantage is that once you have a wide neck diverticulum, you can actually uh, instill your intravesical chemo or immunotherapy and that would definitely come in contact with this diverticulum and empty as well. Okay, <clears throat> situation number six, which is how to stratify disease. Not all muscle invasive cancers are the same. 
there are some which are bad cancer some are good and you need to stratify them these are the points that you all know are used for stratification sorry this is the point that the pathologist should report in your uh, specimen the grading system low risk tumors are primary solitary ta low grade less than 3 cm no carcinoma in situ high grade any t high grade cis multiple tumors greater than 3 cm intermediate in between these two okay so uh, and this can be easily done and these are the two different systems uh, kyoto has an additional thing of gender as well urtc does not have this is the app that all of you should have in your and uh, phones in your mobile phones iphones so you can freely uh, download this app once you have a patient in the lab in in the clinic once with the pathology report you need to just tap these buttons whether it's a primary tumor there was one tumor two to seven tumors or eight or more tumors is it ta or t1 is it uh, less than or greater than 3 cm is there concomitant cis and uh, what is the grading system how was the grade so all this information is always available with the histopathology report and once you have tapped these buttons it will tell you what are the probability of recurrence and what is the probability of progression in this patient in terms of percentage you can counsel your patient and then devise treatment methodology according to that long term follow up is again dependent upon what kind of disease you have low risk intermediate risk and high risk follow up is different they are not manage uh, the same i'm just uh, running out short of time so i'm going to rush a little bit obturator reflex who has not seen an obturator reflex during trp trbt all of you have it's a problem right so what do you do what do you do talk obturator reflex pata kya hoti hai aapse puchu ji ji Uh, it's a reflex section by the optic nerve as we as the uh, dietary current goes through. Mm -hmm. So what happens? Uh, there is a yeah, 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 yeah. so the patient kicks you, yes, right? Sir. Adductor or abductors? Which one activate? Adductor. 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 So adductor. What will happen? Medial towards. Medial towards. Okay. So what do you do? If you have a large lateral wall tumor, what can you do? Under GA. Under GA, that yeah. takes care of the obturator reflex. I just sir completely paralyze the patient. I just want to block the obturator nerve. How do you block the obturator nerve? Oh, just anesthesia. <laughs> so I'll just show you how to block the obturator nerve. You can also do it if your anesthetist is not. Run the uh, video, please. So these are the anatomical markings. RBT is ordinarily conducted under lumbar spinal anesthesia. An obturator nerve block is also used in order to prevent the obturator nerve reflex. For the obturator nerve block, we mark the pubic tubercle on the side of the block. The needle is inserted two centimeters lateral and two centimeters inferior to that point. Here's the obturator nerve block process. A pole needle connected this is what to happens. an electrostimulator is inserted perpendicularly. After the needle encounters the inferior pubic ramus, it is withdrawn slightly to subcutaneous depth and is then advanced slightly lateral and superior through the obturator canal to induce the obturator nerve response. After confirming that the response has been induced, a local anesthetic is injected. See, now the nerve stimulation is going on, but there is no movement. So the obturator nerve is completely blocked, and you can go ahead and do. If you have tumors on both sides, on the both lateral walls, you can do it bilaterally. Okay, uh, your anesthetist does it good. Otherwise, you can ask. You can do it yourself. The only problem is that you would not be able to. This is one of the studies in which, uh, with the use of obturator block, you decreases the chances of various jerks problems during resection significantly. Now, what if you doing a check cystoscopy under local anesthetic and you find a small recurrence? What would you do? A very tiny, small, little T type of recurrence. The simplest thing, if you're doing a flexible cystoscopy, 
You don't really need to take a biopsy. You don't need to reschedule your patient under general anesthetic. You can go ahead, use a bug bee, and use your bug bee on your flexible cystoscope and burn that area. You don't really need to do anything and schedule him for another three, three months. If it is at six weeks, six months or one year, schedule him back for uh, three months. Okay, I'll stop here. If there are any questions, otherwise uh, we can go ahead for the second presentation. So in case of the diabetic disease, we should explain this is a tumor is a larger one, and uh, we are not uh, able to have the correct biopsy because it's very difficult to know what the things. Uh, then, uh, can we go for the directly diverting lectomy? I think. Uh, yeah, I mean laparoscopic or open diverticulectomy is is an option. Uh, generally, it should be avoided as much as possible, because the whole idea is that it is like taking an open biopsy, right? You need to make sure that there is no disease elsewhere in the bladder. So be very careful, maybe take a few random biopsies that's indicated in this situation and make sure there is no other disease. If there is none, then you can go ahead and uh, do a laparoscopic or open diverticulectomy. Okay, uh, if you're dealing with a growth in your uretaric orifice, is there any added advantage of passing the uretaric strand before resection? Unless you don't see it. Otherwise, you want to see it while you're resecting it. If you have seen it while you're resecting it, then obviously there is no advantage. Then you have to pass a double J stent. Right? So, I mean, if you feel comfortable, and most gynecologists will feel comfortable with the ureteric <laughs> stents. <laughs> so, I just know where the ureter is. Yeah, if, uh, if that uh, intramural part, uh, you can uh, go through it, see through it uh, after resection, uh, should we pass a D J stent? Well, if you are uncomfortable and you think that the, this uh, ureter is either with the effect of diathermy or direct injury to the ureter, intramural ureter, or ureteric orifice itself, then yes. But normal situation, and you would not probably need but to. But does the fear to putting any stain? Well, the idea is that your intravesical urine, which is going to reflux into the kidneys, potentially contains. Uh, yeah, but that has never been proven scientifically. There is a question from. There is a question from Institute of Yes. Uh, Dr. Ryan asked a question. He said that can we use colonium laser for bladder tumor resection instead of using Collins knife? Yeah, absolutely. The Collins knife is something that uh, I feel comfortable, but. Uh, colonium laser and you use uh, 550 micron fiber and you can resect. Even you can use 365 microns at uh, 40 watts. You can resect the whole thing just like uh, we have done it with the Collins knife. So yes, you can do it. It's it's uh, the safety is your ability to hold and uh, maintain the fiber in place. So if there are no more questions, uh, may I request Dr. Nazim to please come and talk about the principles of QRBT, and then we can take you through to the practical step with Dr. Nazim, myself, and Dr. Rizzi. Thank you, Dr. Amar. <clears throat> so uh, I think most of the points which I am presenting in my slides have been covered by Dr. Hamad. So he was discussing difficult cases, but during the discussion of difficult cases, he has covered the uh, one of the I mean important aspects that is the principles of surgery. Right, so uh, already mentioned by Dr. Ahmad that the bladder tumor is the second most common tumor of genital urinary tract. By the way, which one is the first? Prostate. Okay. So 90% of bladder tumor are urothelial carcinomas and out of which more than two thirds are, in fact, three fourths are non-muscle invasive bladder tumor. That is TA, TIS and T1. Well explained by Dr. Ahmad previously. The transurethral resection of bladder tumor, which is TURBT, is the initial key step and the current standard, gold standard for the initial diagnosis of 
all kind of bladder cancers both muscle invasive non muscle invasive and the other variants and it is curative in the non muscle invasive bladder tumors bladder cancer for the bladder cancer the proper diagnosis and efficient treatment is is still challenging because this is a disease which has significant impact on patient's life there are higher chances of recurrence and uh, progression of the disease so because of this high recurrence rate the quality of turbt a good quality turbt not only allows the pathologist to accurately evaluate the histopathological status but it also impacts the risk of recurrence and patient outcome so as we all know that eortc risk calculators have six things the primary versus recurrent tumor t stage grade number of lesions size and carcinoma in situ and the lower three ones the number of lesions size and carcinoma in c2 these are the three things which you can have evaluated on cystoscopy so visual detection and resection is central to the optimal diagnosis and treatment what are the problems with non muscle invasive bladder cancer the high risk high grade non invasive tumors have significant risk of residual disease and it has been shown that up to 50% of bladder tumor can have residual disease and out of which 15% can be up stage subsequently and 6 to 10% show a progression from a ta to t1 or a low grade to high grade tumor in the in the later part with eventual lethal outcome carcinoma in c2 also has got very high recurrence rate up to 50% on first cystoscopy so the goal of turbt is the eradication of all visible tumor to obtain adequate tissue specimen so that the tumor can be pathologically evaluated its histology its grading and staging can be identified and uh, documented and obviously what's the t stage and grade so we all know that you do a turbt for any suspicious lesion in the bladder or you do a biopsy the contraindications are so untreated uti or uh, uh, uncorrected coagulopathy and obviously these are the absolute contraindications the relative contraindications are patient related if patient has significant cardiopulmonary conditions or the uh, other conditions which put him at high risk for the anesthesia and perioperative uh, during the perioperative period these are the relative contraindications so how would you preoperatively prepare a patient for turbt mohit so for your right so patient ko uh, you will send the patient for risk stratification so preoperatively the patient is is okay what else right so you will do a urine culture and you will treat uti if it is culture proven if the patient is taking escard so you should stop at 5 to 7 days if he is taking clopidogrel 7 to 10 days right what else so you will counsel the patient and uh, you will do informed consent and i mean uh, what about antibiotics uh, if, if you don't need just one shot before so again this is controversial but the guidelines generally say that for a small tumor only one single shot prophylactic antibiotic is sufficient if the tumor is large or there is a lot of necrotic component then you need three doses of antibiotic anesthesia general anesthesia with complete relaxation and paralysis or it can be done under a spinal anesthesia but be prepared for the obturator jerk what are the instruments that you need for a turbt so obviously you would need a telescope if you have the option of buying only one telescope which one would you buy 30 degree or 0 degree 30 degree so uh, a, a, a scope then there is working element for turbt which comprises of a resectoscope this is the endovision sheath in the resectoscope you have an outer sheath the inner sheath through the outer sheath uh, irrigation goes on and through the inner sheath there is suction and then there there are different kind of loops so th there are different kinds of resection devices there are loops there are uh, the ball electrode and then there are collins knife and then there are straight loops besides that you would need a uh, elec evacuator to evacuate the 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 tumor uh, chips you would definitely need a light source you would need a camera you would need a monitor and an irrigation fluid what else 
depending upon whether you have monopolar T or monopolar uh, uh, electrocautery or the bipolar electrocautery, you would need the the glycine. glycine or and, and the the energy source so positioning this is the appropriate positioning of a patient for tur beating the thighs should be bent and at an angle of 90 degrees because it will allow the surgeon a maneuverability the buttocks should be kept at the edge of the table otherwise again it will difficult your maneuverability difficult this is the this is how the operating room setup looks like you would have a, a tower, you would have the, the irrigation fluid on the left side. The uh, monitor is generally at the level of, uh, of the, the operating surgeon's head. The operating surgeon sits in between the patient's uh, thighs. The whole area is prepped and draped and only the, the, the penis is, is exposed. So uh, coming to the principles according to 2017 EAU guidelines uh, mentioned by Dr. Hamad as well, that TURBT followed by pathological investigation is essential step in treatment of non-muscle invasive bladder tumor. The recommendations, uh, recommendations is that the TURBT should be performed systematically. First of all, a bimanual palpation should be done under general anesthesia. Then you under vision, you in, insert a resectoscope. You inspect the whole urethra, the prostatic urethra, whole of the urothelial lining of bladder. If there is no gross lesion and the cytology is positive, you would take random biopsies or cold cup biopsies as well as biopsies from the prostatic urethra. For the tumor, you would resect it. You can resect it, you resect it piecemeal or you can resect it arm block. And it is important that you, you record the findings of TURBT by virtue of bladder diagram. So this is bladder diagram. And this is this should be a, a uniform diagram with all these points. One should be the trigone, two should be the right ureteric orifice, and so on and so forth. And arm block resection or uh, a resection in piecemeal for the exophytic part of tumor is recommended. Cauterization should be avoided as much as you can because the more you coagulate or more you cauterize, it will it will make uh, the specimen difficult for the histopathologist to evaluate. And as mentioned previously, uh, if there is no obvious obvious lesion, then you should take random biopsies from the prostatic urethra as well as from the bladder. Second look or second uh, uh, TYBT or relook to TYBT should be done after two to six weeks. If there is no muscle tissue in the first biopsy, if this is a T1 lesion, or if you know that you have incompletely resected the tumor. Right. So uh, the surgical technique of TURBT. So again, as I mentioned that the bladder should be evaluated systematically. And the typical resection is in the anti-grade direction in which you move your resecting loop forward to backwards towards the resectoscope. So the loop of resectoscope is placed behind the tumor and then it is gently retracted towards the resectoscope. This is the schematic diagram. You see a papillary growth here. You, you take your loop behind it and then you, you resect it from the luminal surface towards the urothelium. And it shows that you resect it in piecemeal from the lumen side downwards, and then you take a biopsy from the tumor base as well. The smaller pedicle tumors can be resected arm block. You can use the monopolar uh, diathermy with the help of the Collins knife. You can use laser as the question was asked from the IKD. But generally, the arm block resection is not suitable if the tumor is larger, more than 2.5 centimeter, or if the tumor is located at the bladder dome or on the anterior wall. So here, uh, you can see an exophytic papillary tumor. And this is the real life picture, how you pass your loop ahead of it and then resect it. This is your advancement of loop through the tumor. And this is how you do a, you, you resect the first strip. Retrograde TURBT, it is generally not recommended to do a retrograde TURBT or advance your loop ahead of you because it carries the high risk of bladder wall perforation. But again, as mentioned in the previous presentation, if you are resecting the tumor arm block for the small papillary lesion, you can adopt this strategy. The loop is placed above the level of urothelium in front of its pedicle. The pedicle is transected by gentle retrograde resection of the loop, and then it is carried out. So Again, this is the schematic diagram. You, you keep the loop above the surface of urothelium at the level of pedicle. You sweep it away. But subsequent biopsy through the tumor base is taken in the anti-grade fashion. 
The next step, once you have taken, once you have removed the visible tumor is the resection of tumor base. So the additional samples are taken from the base of resection, including the retrosal muscle. So uh, should, Sana, should the tumor which is taken from the tumor base be sent with the, the rest of the tumor? It should be labeled and sent separately. So this is how you resect the tumor base. And then the final step is resection from the tumor margin. So it is the tumor VT is completed by additional resection of normal looking urothelium from the lateral margins of the resection. That's how you resect the, the tumor margins. And this is the diagram in which you, you, are, you are seeing a real life picture, how you take, how you remove the edges from the tumor or how you take a deep cold cup biopsy from the tumor base. Now for the broad based tumors, which are non papillary tumor VT starts at the tip that is tip of the iceberg and then you gradually extend it downward. So this is a broad based solid tumor. That's how you resect it. And as already mentioned previously that a tumor which is in the difficult situation in the bladder diverticulum, it's a, it's a special tumor entity because it's a true diverticulum. There is no detrusor muscle. And if you resect it, you are generally passing your loop through the perivesical fat. Therefore, the risk of perforation is very high. Any infiltrative growth uh, through the lamina propria may be equal to P T3 stage and might require aggressive treatment, including the cystectomy. For the lateral wall tumors, if you know beforehand that the tumor is on the right or the left lateral wall, it is better to have a pharmacological blockade of obturator nerve before TURBT and to place the patient under general anesthesia with, with muscle relaxant and complete paralysis. Right? Again, because of the obturator jerk. Again, one of the question is whether one should proceed with monopolar TURBT or bipolar TURBT. Which one is better? Bipolar. Why? Because the chance of obturator reflex is less. One, two. And uh, if there is a uh, you don't uh, worry about uh, the fluid. Uh, you, you, you... Again, the irrigation fluid is generally normal saline, so the chances of TUR syndrome or the fluid over fluid overload, the chances of fluid overload are always there, but the TUR syndrome is less. And there is less less charring or less uh, artifact on the resected specimen. So reduce risk of complication. Yes, for seedlings. RO water. Uh, yeah, normal, uh, distilled water. water. Distilled water. But generally distilled water is not preferred because it is it is it has no tonicity. So you use an isotonic solution which is electrolyte depleted for the conventional monopolar TUR, either TURP or TURBT. Right, so what should be the post-operative care? You have resected a tumor, Salman. How would you uh, take care of that patient post resection? Pass the catheter. catheter. So, which size? What size catheter would you prefer? Okay, good. So, large, large lumen, two way or three way? Three way catheter. So, for how long you would continue irrigation? Right. Right. So, what are the potential complications? Obviously, bleeding, perforation. So perforation can be extra peritoneal if you have resected a tumor from the bladder base. If you have resected it from the anterior wall or from the dome, then it can be intraperitoneal perforation. So how would you manage an intraperitoneal perforation? So can you manage it with, with catheter only? No. So an intraperitoneal uh, perforation requires laparotomy, bladder repair, placement of a peritoneal drain and double drainage of bladder with the suprapubic and perurethral catheter. And again, uh, bladder perforation can be uh, provoked with the obturator, obturator jerk. And in order to prevent it, you should reduce the power, cutting power up to 70 watts. And uh, again, damage to the ureteric orifice. So ureteric orifices can be resected if there is tumor involvement at the ureteric orifices. The damage can be minimized if you use pure cut. And if you suspect any injury to the ureteric orifice and, and uh, subsequent stenosis or vesicoureteric reflux, then a double J stent can be placed in case of any doubt. So this is last slide. Uh, following the resection, it is a principle and it is an established practice to give single installation of chemotherapeutic agent. And uh, the meta-analysis by Sylvester 
has shown that it decreases it decreases the recurrence rate by 39%. Single installation of chemotherapeutic agent should be given preferably within first six hours. And what are the contraindications for single installation of chemotherapeutic agent? If there is ongoing hematuria or if you suspect there is perforation because of systemic absorption. The most common agent used worldwide for sicca is mitomycin C. However, you can use thiotipa, you can use apirubicin, doxorubicin, etc. Thank you very much. So any queries regarding the principles, basic principles? It was, it was I think, uh, a very basic presentation, mainly for the, the audience who are younger and who, who are doing, who are starting doing the TURBTs. So any queries, any questions? There is a query from Rob Regan. Mm -hmm. He asked how to proceed to perforate debra diverticulum while dissecting diverticulum tumor. So if you if you have perforated the diverticulum, which means that you have perforated the bladder. So in that case, again, it depends upon the location. If it's a paraurectic diverticulum, obviously perforation of a diverticular tumor means that you have upstaged the disease. The tumor has spilled outside the bladder. But again, if you are suspecting an extra peritoneal perforation, the location of diverticulum is at the bladder base. If it is a para uh, urethral diverticulum, then you can manage it by simply placing a catheter for 7 to 10 days and then you can do a cystogram and then take the catheter out. If the location of diverticulum, however, is, is near the dome or uh, not near the base, then obviously the patient would require laparotomy and repair. So if, if there are no more questions, I would request Dr. Razioudin uh, to move on. For the next session, we have opportunity to practice the procedure. Um, maybe we can have some mid level residents. How many of you are second or third year? So we have how much? We have 35 minutes and uh, this usually takes about five to seven minutes, so we'll try to accommodate as many as possible. Ajo. Pelek, demonstrate. Mm. Yeah, we have a simple one. TRP, 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 bladder tumor. Bladder tumor, TRP. Let's start with this. Hmm. Keyboard to need you. Acha. So what it does is uh, you have to uh, first go in. So who's coming? Who's the first person? Up are you? Are you the first person? Kya naam hai aapka? Marvi. So what, uh, what it, it will score you, you have to go in, see, inspect like you normally do. You look at the horror faces, you look at all the bladder. So we, I think, I think the, the one who is performing here can sit because we have projected it already ah, on the... Ah. On the monitor. Ah, rest can sit and then uh, we'll try to. Ajo. And we can have Sorry. interactive discussion in between as well. She's on the hot seat. Ask this picture. Ah, see. Ah, see. Ah, see. Ah, see. Ah, see. Why is the color of uh, the paddle different for cutting and coagulation? And why is the sound different? Marvi? Sir, um, we use uh, yellow for cutting and uh, cork for blue for why, why is it like that? Let's start with the time. And why is the sound different? Uh, it's a, no, no. In your in your theater, also, it's the same, right? 
the idea of simulator is to Judge, you so you you keep this closed whenever you're yeah. inspecting. At the moment you're yes, inspecting, please. right? So look at the ureteric orifices. Find the ureteric orifices, both of them, and uh, look at the tumor all around. Come back to the bladder, then. Eh? Mm. Do a systematic. Kaise, kaise aap, um, how do you find? Uh, what is the method? Can we just go inside and see if the chair was first. Huh? Uh, right. Sabse pehle triangle nazar ठीक है कर लो ट्राइगोन पहले देखो पुस्टियर बॉल देखो या सो द क्वेश्चन इज हाउ टू फाइंड द यूरेटेरिक ऑरिफिसिस ठीक है इसका कोई मेथड है या बस नजर आ जाता है yeah yes so so you you go in the neck yes and you look at the you look at the trigon trigon ke color different hota hai right it's more vascular usually then you look at the interureteric bar which lies in between the two ureteric orifices oh, yeah sometime if the bladder is very tuberculated you have difficulty finding it. so so you must find the interureteric bar first from the neck Yes, you have to do it systematically. ठीक है ये नहीं है कि एक इधर right letter देख लिया फिर left letter देख लिया और 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 ये ही इसकी जो judge करेगा उसमें आपको कम score करेगा अगर आप haphazardly कर रहे हैं तो ठीक है I think time to start. So everyone knows how the thirty degree scope looks like. How does it look like? It looks down. ठीक है. So when you're looking at the right little wall, you turn it like that. When you're looking at the left little wall, you look at that. Then ऊपर देखने के लिए आप बिल्कुल उसको उल्टा करते हैं और फिर you push the bladder, right? So this is a larger tumor. It's more than 2.5 centimeter. So the methods that were told previously, you will use that. You will cut that apex, and then you go down with each cut. So you be be careful. The bladder is full; it's not empty, and it's not too distended. You know, adequately distended. Otherwise. What can happen? Ah, uh, if it's not distended, you may cut uh, the the wall behind it, right? You may cause a perforation. यहाँ पे ये दास का भी बताएगा कि ह्यूमर आपने कितनी बना दी है, ठीक है? सही है, सही बता रहे हैं। एक और भी है इसमें Have you done this on on a on a patient before? So how does it feel? Uh, is it it is similar or very different? No, it's different. What different? Sir, like uh, in the real patient, it's more difficult. नहीं बताएँ मतलब tension नहीं है इसमें time हो गया है five minutes में Fifteen minutes. Eh? So it's a very high fidelity simulation, uh, and it mimics the almost, I mean, the real situation of our team.
देखो ब्लीडिंग की वजह से आपका विजन खराब हो रहा है I think you're almost done. Okay, hundred percent, ninety-eight percent. Okay, one little bit. Good. Okay, hundred percent. Okay. So once done, um, you should take a biopsy, deep biopsy, and make sure. There is some muscle and send it in a separate container. So that's important to send it in a separate container. Okay. Right. So she resected uh, full tumor, both of them. Ajo. Safety visualization, bladder service. Time a very good score. Yeah. Blood lost. Not much blood lost. Safety uh, is very good. ठीक है. आप कौन से level के? R two. हाँ? R two. R two. ठीक है. थोड़ा सा हाँ, थोड़ा सा different, थोड़ा सा difficult कर देते हैं. Case three कर देते हैं. Case three. हाँ. चलें जी. So it's the same. You inspect first, have a look around, and then uh, start. So slightly larger tumors. There. How many tumors are there? ये कैमरा हमेशा, so this is usually at the six o'clock position, right? आप अंदर चलो, वहीं आ गया हाँ। ठीक है, you had a good look. Any comments? Are welcome. Hello. One year the 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 one year Okay. 
So this one is a slightly broad based tumor, so you have to be very careful. So as a rule, if there is little bit of bleeding and it's not uh, bothering you too much and it's not uh, obscuring your view and you have to cut more, then you cut. Uh, you don't need to coagulate. But if you if, if you can't proceed any further uh, without coagulating, then you coagulate first, right? Once you've started to cut, you should try and keep your hand stable, right? So, ek to aap loop ko move kar rahe na. So, ek aap agar scope ko bhi move karenge, to you have another dimension of uh, movement. Try not to move that. That becomes very dangerous. Do all of you use um, a camera while doing this? Sabke centers mein hota hai? Hundred percent. Koi camera ke bagayar karta hai? Mm. So tumor which is located at the dome, what other maneuver would you like to do? Anterior wall or dome ke junction par? Press karte hai. Upper level press karte hai. So parachute half turn or half turn? And you can ask your assistant to apply a constant pressure. Don't um, keep on shaking his hand. Yeah. It will be difficult for you to operate with one hand and then put the other hand on the supervision. Yahan pe ab you might want to find the bleeder first because it's, it's pretty risky to proceed any further, right? So you have to hurry up, it's like two, one tumor you've done, the other tumor is 30 percent. Thank you. 
थोड़ी देर के लिए वैल्व क्लोज कर सकते हैं बिकॉज गिविंग यू एंड टू क्लोज द वैल्व एंड देन ये फ्लोटिंग है हाँ ये ऐसे रहते हैं आप कौन से सेंटर से हैं Thank <laughs> you. 
just want to know if you can use Lazia instead of Vision by Google uh, or Microsoft. Or you ever have experience with it? <laughs> Frustrate okay. So sometimes you get I do not know I have made so much. But normally my computer it can talk by you go, I think we can we have like So yes, I think you finished it. Let's look at the bricks. I mean, let's see. So you got all the thing. Uh, what about the safety? Let's see. Tool active without contact. So so one, one mistake that is pointed out is that without touching the tumor, you were you had your foot on the on, on the cutting, right? So that's dangerous. Uh, so, uh, so that even if by mistake you put your foot, you will not uh, injure anything, right? Kabi kabi aisa hota hai, wo aapko temptation hoti hai uske upar ek. If you have your foot on it, it's going to be very dangerous. So, so, so never, never put your foot when you're doing that, right? We've had residents. Making their marks inside the bladder. So, <laughs> chalo. Next, who wants to come? Who Time, thoda hai. I don't know. Next sessions. Who are you? Are you from? Where are you from? Lakhat. Okay. Okay. Second wala, jo case tha na, wo chhe. Usme do hain aur ha. Chale. हाँ सेकंड इसमें दो ट्यूमर्स हैं तो थोड़ा जल्दी हो जाता है वो ज़्यादा बड़े बड़े हैं वी कैन ट्राई एंड स्क्वीज़ वन मोर पर्सन ना ठीक है अब इसको लाइन करके फर्स्ट यू हैव टू इंस्पेक्ट है ना सर जैसे करते हैं इसको अंदर रखो जब जब आप सिस्टोस्कोपी करने की कोशिश करें उसको अंदर रखो हाँ ये वो यू यू वो नजर आए दूसरा वो हाँ ठीक है ब्लैडर की ऑल अराउंड देख लो यस So this camera has made learning very important, uh, very, very easy, right? For us also who are teaching, 
जरा सा गड़बड़ होती है हम हाथ पकड़ सकते हैं ठीक है वरना एंगजाइटी सिखाने वाले की एंगजाइटी भी बहुत ज्यादा होती है तो लाइक वी हैव बीन ट्रेंड ऑन आइर वो दिखा दिया एक दफा दिखा दिया फिर अच्छा ये काटने लगे हम या वी हैड दो टीचिंग एड्स विच वर हॉरेबल इतने में हैवी हैवी होते थे एक इधर लगा देते थे और हम ऐसे माइक्रोस्कोप की तरफ पकड़ के देख होते थे जैसे ब्लीडिंग होती थी वो उतार देते थे हमारे जो टीचर्स होते थे तो इसमें एक तो मैग्नीफाइड है आप गलती करें तो पकड़ सकते हैं आपको इससे टीचिंग बड़ी आसान हो गई है चलो तुमने जो कर दिया है अब उसको करो क्योंकि वो फिर आपको नंबर कम देगा इसमें तीन की उम्र है अच्छा ठीक So what settings do we use when you're doing a TRBT? What coagulation settings? What cutting settings? Hundred. Hmm. Hundred. Yeah. One, normally we start with one twenty and sixty, and then we reduce. वो जो operator kick की बात हुई थी, उसमें अगर ये हो रहा हो तो you can actually reduce the setting also, right? या अगर ब्लेंड को आप एडजस्ट कर सकते हैं और आप सेटिंग्स भी कम कर सकते हैं always try to touch the bleeder with the apex and then hawai fire nahi karne usme touch karke aur fir karne hai right These are smaller ones. They'll be using. Maybe you try to come from the other side. I say, "Come on, let's go this side." 
sé, ajá. No sé, pero no me imagino, o sea. Está chaval, no es digna, no, me ayuda a ver, por favor. What do you want to do next start? Tell me again. Okay. Namaz are you? Hmm? Okay. Hmm. Hmm. I'll contact her. Okay. Now we'll squeeze in one more. Uh -huh. second you were uh, without um, active you know you were active without contact otherwise uh, visibility was good no blood loss very good procedure time was uh, good goal was less than 600 seconds cumulative path length so it was good very good.
and which which shows the the various wavelengths of lights against the tissue and the absorption by of the laser against the tissue so the holmium laser is highly absorbed by water and that's how it it induces a clear uh, cut to, through the tissues and majority of it is absorbed superficially with minimal collateral damage now holmium laser enucleation of prostate or holup is the minimal invasive procedure for bph and uh, we will discuss that it is independent of prostate size there is no limitation of pros prostate size for holup in contrast to turp the holup uses an end firing laser which cut grooves into the prostate down to the level of capsule and we will discuss in the subsequent session what are the principles the adenoma is separated from the capsule similar to what we used to do in the open prostatectomy the lobes are dissected off from the capsule the prostate these lobes are then pushed into the bladder and then are fragmented with the help of morselator or with the help of, help of the of a loop just like you do a transurethral dissection however holmium have uh, holup has a steep learning curve and it is difficult to master as compared to vaporization techniques so this is a typical resectoscope for performing the holup which is generally a 24 to 26 french sheath it has got a modified inner sheath metal sheath through which you pass a laser fiber and it is it has also the property to stabilize the laser fiber this is the light source and that's the morselator that's the handle of it and then the morselator goes through the scope into the bladder where you resect the prostate lobes so what are the technical principles of holup so first of all you do a blunt dissection with the help of resectoscope you use the resectoscope beak to continuously push the adenoma and you at the same time dissect it with the help of the laser fiber holmium laser gives sharp incisions in the prostate and at the same time it not only vaporizes it but it also coagulates it therefore there is very minimal bleeding while performing the holup the plane is developed it is identified between the adenoma and the surgical capsule and it is it is very much similar to what used to be done in the open prostatectomy and what's the principle is that once you release the laser pulse it generates a steam bubble and the steam bubble disrupts or it 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 bursts very quickly in microseconds which is generated in front of the laser fiber and this the energy which is liberated from the bubble it it a steam bubble it uh, it uh, actually dissects the tissue off the minimum power or intensity of holmium laser that is needed for the holup is at least 80 watts and the setting of 2 to 2.5 joules and 20 to 550 hertz is used and the fiber diameter is 550 micron and it is an end fire end firing holmium fiber the tissue effect is rapid and hemostasis is excellent now coming to the literature evidence so uh, this is a generic slide which shows that there are many randomized control trials there are many meta analysis and systematic reviews and it it has shown that what is good about holup holup has shorter hospital stay compared to turp it has shorter catheterization time it has less blood loss and you can have much more tissue resected as compared to turp what is bad about holup it has longer operation time and it has a, it has much more steeper learning curve compared to tur and what is the same it has the efficacy in terms of the ipss in terms of maximum flow in terms of pvr which is equivalent to turp and the sexual function remains the same with both the modalities and in uk it is the only laser technique which is approved by national institute of clinical excellence so the pvp the thulium laser etc these are not approved over there so this is a recently published a study which was about a, which is a systematic review and meta analysis it included 15 studies and eight randomized control including eight randomized control trials and it showed a head to head comparison of holup versus turp and uh, nearly 850 patients were included the efficacy indicators they and they analyzed three indicators the efficacy indicators the safety indicators and perioperative indicators the efficacy indicators were not significantly different between the two in terms of quality of life in terms of post void residual volume ipss and qmax so both were similar 
In terms of safety, the hollow was much more safer because it has it showed less blood loss and less need for the blood transfusion. However, there was no significant difference in terms of early and the late, late post-operative complication in this meta-analysis. The perioperative indicators showed that HOLAP required much more longer time and a shorter catheterization time. This is another meta-analysis, a bit older one, and it showed that HOLAP was superior in the pooled estimate of studies as compared to TORP in terms of, again, shorter catheterization time, 17 to 31 hours, compared to 43 to 57 hours for TOR. Hospital stay was about one to three days for one to two and a half days for HOLAP as compared to two to about three and a half, four days for TURP. However, TURP was superior because it had less operative time, the same, I mean, more or less the same result as compared to the previous meta-analysis. There are other trials and meta-analysis which have compared holmium laser enucleation versus open prostatectomy. And HOLEP was found to have a longer operative time compared to open prostatectomy, shorter catheterization time, shorter hospital stay, less perioperative blood transfusion, and there were no significant difference in terms of need for reoperation. History, uh, the, the, the risk of uh, the stricture and blood and neck contraction and incontinence. And the quality indicators in terms of efficacy, that is IPSS and QMAX were similar in both the short term as well as long term follow up. This is a famous randomized control trial, which is, which is I think, cited a hundred of times by Kuntz, and it was published in EAU, um, uh, European Journal of Uro European Urology. And it was a head-to-head -head trial, one-to-one -one randomization with HOLAP versus open prostatectomy, and they included larger prostates, those which were more than 100 grams. And the preoperative and postoperative assessments were done according to IPSS or AUA the QMAX post-wide residual volume, and these indices were measured at one, one month, three months, six months, and thereafter annually. These, this, is the table, uh, this is the table which shows the baseline characteristics between the two groups, the Holmium, Holab group, as well as open prostatectomy. Both the groups were similar with regard to age, prostate volume, detrusor pressure, Q, P dot QMAX, detrusor pressure at maximum flow, the, uh, the, the QMAX post-wide residual volume and IPSS. And this is the table which shows the efficacy measures in terms of AUS score, the QMAX, and residual volume. And you can appreciate that preoperatively, the, uh, the IPSS was very high, 22 and 21 in both groups, and it dropped to 2.3, near about between 2 to 3 at the short term as well as on the long term. Similarly, the QMAX was very low. For the big prostate, it was 3.8 and 3.6, and it increased up to 27, 28, up to 30. And the effect was maintained in the long term up to five years. The residual volume were very high, up to 280, up to 300 in the pre-op period, and it dropped to negligible range, both in the short terms and in the long terms. So HOLAP was as effective as open prostatectomy regarding improvement in maturation, and it seems to be a true endourological alternative to open prostatectomy. I've taken this uh, this table from the EAU guidelines, which has which has summarized the different RCTs and uh, uh, and the results of follow-up with regard to improvement in urodynamic parameters, symptom score, and PSA reduction. And you would see that these are the head-to-head -head trials between HOLAP and TURP, the mean prostate size, which were comparable in all of them. And you can see that there was near about 80 to 90 percent improvement in the change in the symptoms, and and around. 500 to 700 percent improvement in QMAX and around 100 percent improvement in the post wide residual volume. Similarly, these are the other trials comparing the TURP and HOLAP and this one, which we just discussed between HOLAP and open prostatectomy, and more or less the same results. Now, what does literature say about the complication with HOLAP? So this is a study which was again uh, published in 2005. It's a bit older one, but it's a larger series of more than 1,800 uh, 800 patients. And it showed that HOLAP has a blood transfusion rate of only 1% with perioperative mortality of only 0.05%. The capsular perforation rate range between 0.3 to 10%, and it has comparable outcome as compared to TURP and open prostatectomy. 
No statistically significant difference was found between HOLOP and TURP with regard to urethral strictures. It was not significant, but it was higher in the TURP, 4.4% versus 2.6% in HOLOP group. With regard to stress incontinence, both have similar uh, complication rate of 1.5%. The blood transfusion was virtually nil in HOLOP as compared to TUR. And the need for re-intervention was almost half in the HOLOP group as compared to TURP group. Now, what does literature say about HOLOP and prostate size? So HOLOP outcome has been shown to be independent of prostate size and shape uh, based upon the data from high quality RCTs. Therefore, American Urological Association guidelines have said that it is a surgical option for men with larger prostate that is more than 100 grams. And EAU guideline recommended for any prostate which is more than 80 grams. So this is a study which was published in 2017 and it included three groups for, uh, it included both the small, large and the giant prostates. It included around 459 patients divided into three groups. Group one was uh, for the prostate less than 100 grams, group two for prostate between 100 to 200 grams and group three for more than 200 grams. And these patients underwent HOLEP and they were followed up for, a, for 18 months. This is the intraoperative finding as expected, the group three with the prostates of more than 200 grams, they have higher operative time in the terms of enucleation, morcellation, and higher weight of enucleated tissue, which was all statistically significant. Surprisingly, in the larger prostates, the enucleation efficacy and morcellation efficacy in terms of gram resected per minute was higher for the larger prostate as compared to the smaller prostate. For the post-operative indices, the catheterization time for the small and the giant prostate was similar, around 24 hours. The hospitalization was also more or less the same in terms of days. The post-operative bleeding was similar, but the urinary incontinence was much more prevalent, 16% compared to 7% between the small and giant prostates. And the functional outcomes were more or less similar in all three groups in terms of IPSS quality of life, QMAX, and post-wide residual volume. Now, what does literature say about the prostate morphology? Whether HOLAP is good for a bilobar prostatic enlargement or a trilobar prostatic enlargement? So, Wiesenbauer et al., this is another uh, recent study which was published in urology, and they compared outcome of HOLAP in trilobar versus bilobar prostate. They included 300, more than 300 patients, out of which 142 were, had bilobar prostate and 162 had trilobar prostate. The operative time was a bit shorter, 100 minutes for bilobar one as compared to 112 minutes for trilobar. And the post-operative outcome were similar in, in the two groups in terms of IPSS and the change in IPSS, QMAX and the change in QMAX, the quality of life or bother score, post wide residue and the complication rates. Now, HOLAP as retreatment, can we use HOLAP as a retreatment for a prostate which has regrown after the initial, initial surgery? So we all know that recurrent BPH or in a recurrent, uh, the, the prostate can regrow because of, uh, uh, after a, a time span of like eight to 10 years, or if the initial surgery is inadequate, then it can regrow and the, the, the retreatment is required in about three to 8.6% of men after five years. So HOLEP has been found to be feasible as well as safe as a retreatment modality. And it has shown excellent outcomes for men who have previous BPH surgery. It has shown that surgical retreatment for BPH regrowth after TURP and photo vaporization of prostate ranges between 5 to 17.7 percent. While for the HOLEP, the, uh, the, the retreatment, the need for retreatment is only up to 1.4 percent. This is a study which is published in December 2017 in Journal of Urology by Marion et al. And it was a multi-center series, and they compared primary HOLAP, those who underwent primary HOLAP, about 1182 patients, versus those who had retreatment with HOLAP in 360 patients. And they found that there was no difference between the primary HOLAP versus retreatment in terms of QMAX and post-wide residual uh, volume. But the retreatment arm was actually found to have a shorter operative time, less blood loss, shorter day of stay, and less tissue resected. However, the, the, there was slightly higher rate of post-operative clot retention in the retreatment, retreatment arm as compared to primary HOLEP. 
Now, what about urinary retention? So, post follow up, uh, there are two studies, Johnson et al. and Peterson et al., and they showed that post follow up, all patients were voiding spontaneously without any complications. The Johnson et al. study was a comparative study, and they compared the outcome in those individuals who were voiding spontaneously prior to HOLAP compared to those who had actually urinary retention and were operated by HOLAP. And they found that the non-retention group had a lower blood transfusion rate and did not require long-term catheterization, but the functional outcome were equal in, the both, in both groups. What about sexual function? So the studies have shown that the rate of retrograde ejaculation is slightly less as compared to TUR, ranging from 70 to 80%. What about sexual function? So there are prospective studies which have compared Holmium laser enucleation versus TURP, and the sexual outcomes are similar both in terms of type of sexual dysfunction as well as frequency. And those are studies which have utilized the objective parameters like IIEF, International Index of Erectile Function, they have found that there was, uh, there was no influence of HOLAP in terms of overall sexual function with regard to erection and satisfaction of the patient as well as satisfaction of the partner. Kim et al. have done a study and they found that some patients after HOLAP actually showed improvement in IIEF parameters and Elshal et al. have found that more than 60% of patients reported improvement in sexual function. So HOLAP actually improves the sexual function as well. Now what about anticoagulation? So can we do HOLAP in a patient who is, who is on anticoagulation? Yes. So both for antiplatelate as well as thrombolytic therapies? For ASCARD, for clopidogrel versus for warfarin? Right? Yes. So this is a paper which, uh, again, is a review paper published recently, and it showed that uh, uh, that performing HOLAP in, on patients who are on anticoagulation therapy is feasible and safe. However, those patients who are on anticoagulation therapy requires longer hospital stay, increased length of catheterization, and increased risk of requiring transfusion. And this is the summary from the same paper in which they have compared the anticoagulant group versus control group all kind of anticoagulation in, in the stable aspirin, diapyridamol, warfarin, and then anoxaparin, clopidogrel. So anticoagulation group in this, in the first study showed less enucleation time, more length, length of stay, and the similar transfusion rate. Here again, you see, see the more length of stay, more transfusion, and increased length of stay and more transfusion in the, in the patients who are using, uh, who are on anticoagulants, but it is safe and feasible. The urinary incontinence rates between HOLAP and TURP are same, and the randomized control trial by Montorsi have shown that 44% rate of urge incontinence following the HOLAP. But after one month, majority of patients have resolved. Uh, they, they, they are free from urge incontinence. Again, Kuntz et al. have shown that two thirds of men with preoperative urge urinary incontinence, they experience resolution of symptoms by 12 weeks in the post-operative period. While Jilling et al. have shown, shown that there is similar incontinence score between TURP and HOLEP. And the stress urinary incontinence in these randomized control trials, in all these three randomized control trials, was around 1%. So what, again, this is a paper which was published in 2016 by Kobayashi from Japan, International Journal of Urology. And they tried to find out the predictive risk factors of post-operative urinary incontinence following Holmium laser enucleation of prostate. So they reviewed predictors of post-operative urge incontinence, including 203 patients. And they found that the overall rate of in urinary, so not urge incontinence, urinary incontinence was 24% out of which 55% experienced stress urinary incontinence, 29% urge urinary incontinence, and 16% experienced mixed urinary incontinence. On the multivariate analysis, they found that those patients in whom the operative time was longer, more than 100 minutes, those who have more blood loss, more than a drop of more than 2.5 grams of hemoglobin, they, they were associated, they, they had more development of post-operative post -operative urinary incontinence as compared to, to the ones who have less enucleation time and who have a small volume resection. Now the learning curve. So there are several reports which have shown that the learning curve for HOLAP is very much steep, and these papers have analyzed the completeness of procedure or technical success in terms of complete enucleation, complete morcellation without technical failure, 
in terms of operative time, safety, and complication and conversion of the procedure to TUR or open prostatectomy, as well as the functional outcomes. And these studies have shown that in order to master this procedure, you need at you read between 20 to 50 cases. So this is one of the last slides, and uh, this is describing about the uh, the different treatment modalities for BPH, the monopolar TUR, bipolar TUR, photofibrillation of prostate, and HOLAP. So the level of one evidence exists for all of these modalities. The long-term data is available for monopolar TUR, as well as for the HOLAP. More than five-year mature data is available. So there is no limit for prostate size resection. The duration of stay is less compared to monopolar TUR. And the pathological material is available in HOLAP. It's not available in photovaporization. The TUR syndrome risk is virtually negligible. And the delayed complication rate includes blood and neck contracture, which is similar to the monopolar and bipolar TUR. Urethral stricture rate is less as compared to monopolar TUR. So to summarize, <coughs> HOLAP has the advantage that it is performed safely. And in select cases, you can do it as a daycare procedure. It is a good hemostatic modality, so those patients who are on <coughs> anticoagulation, it can be used safely. The normal saline is being used as an irrigation modality, so there is low risk of TUR syndrome. There is no limit for prostate size. It shows decrease. Uh, it shows advantage in terms of less catheterization time, less blood loss, and less hospital stay. And it has comparable results with respect to standard TUR and open prostatectomy. The disadvantages are initial cost, a steep learning curve, and some of the tissue is lost because of thermal artifact, and it requires increased time for the resection. Thank you very much. Any queries? So what's the take home message for Holab? So do we all agree that it will be a new gold standard treatment for BPH? Yes or no? Why? Just summarize it, summarize it. More safer? Very nice. It can be daycare. It's not a daycare in selected cases. You can have a daycare procedure, right? The retrograde education is more or less the same, but sexual side effect profile is slightly better. The efficacy in terms of object. So I think we, we move on to the next part, which is around the technical aspect of HOLAP. And Professor Ahmad is going to talk about the techniques for bilobar and trilobar HOLAP. Okay, I mean, <clears throat> from the talk, it seems that that's the best thing to do. Uh, anyone is doing it? Is anybody doing HOLAP? Anybody has seen it being done? Videos only? Okay. Now, what are the problems with OLAP? Anyone can tell me what are the problems with OLAP? There must be problems. Otherwise, it could have been taken up by all of us. The first thing is you need laser. So you need to have, uh, obviously, that's you need to have a separate resectoscope. You can't use it with a regular resectoscope. So it is difficult to learn compared to TUR. So one of the major...
critical dissection when you're close to the sphincter, particularly because we know that the sphincter is predominantly anteriorly, right? So anteriorly, you have to be extremely careful, and there is very little window of uh, opportunity in that area. So cut down the power to 45 and cut away from the sphincter, not towards the sphincter. So you're moving the adenoma back into the bladder and cutting away from the sphincter. So this, this is the mucosal strip which is left. And this is identification of this mucosal strip is extremely important because if you go further to that, you will be very close to the sphincter. Again, here in the anterior area, you have to use laser fiber. You need precise cutting. Again, sphincter here. And it is the stretching and pulling on that sphincter with the resectoscope that can cause neuropraxia and little damage to the sphincter with temporary incontinence. So this is something that you need to be very careful about. Last vestiges of uh, the adenoma and uh, here it flops into the bladder. Okay, there it goes into the bladder. So this is one of the lobe done. Same exercise again on the other side, going, giving a midline incision, sorry, giving us five o'clock incision, deepening that incision, moving, defining that groove between the sphincter and the, uh, and the adenoma. So that is once defined, particularly it becomes very difficult when you are at uh, about 2 o'clock to 12 o'clock position. That's the area which is a little difficult. So be very, very careful and do it under clear vision. Because close to the verimontanum, it's very easy. Just lateral to the verimontanum, you can define that groove and uh, develop that plane between the adenoma and the prostatic capsule. But once you are up there, it is really difficult to know where the sphincter is. But uh, this is helped by staying within that groove of sphincter. Again, blunt movement, pushing the whole adenoma with your resectoscope and cutting those things which I select, just like doing an open surgery, a, a combination of blunt and cutting in which you push some tissues, you do define plane. When you're pushing it, you're actually defining that plane automatically. It would not move through the, through the body of the adenoma. You cannot go through the body of the adenoma. You will only go through that plane which gives way. And the plane which gives way is the adenoma and the capsule. Uh, sir, uh, if a very large middle lobe is getting into the bladder, it is possible to cut it and... Uh... So if you have a large median lobe, you will do the three lobe resection. And I'll show you the three lobe resection uh, scheme in which you do the median lobe first. Because median lobe, once out of the way, then you would do a two lobe bar resection, as, as we have shown. The advantage is now when you're doing a TORP, you have TORP in your mind, you have to cut like this. So you actually don't see the bladder, you don't see the end of the adenoma of the median lobe, right? Here, you divide right in front a transfer sensation right in front of the marimontanum and then keep lifting it up. And just when you're lifting it up, you just need to stay in the right plane. If you're in the right plane, you keep lifting it up, you would know when the bladder neck comes and then you need to incise. Cut and it will flop through. So this is the uh, other lobe and uh, it's almost done here. You see, I mean, being in the right plane, there is very little bleeding. And uh, that's why with all kind of anticoagulants, clopidogrel, the data is still patchy and people are really uh, a bit afraid about using clopidogrel. Uh, but warfarin and all other things you can safely do. Patient probably need to stay in the hospital for a little longer. So once both these adenomas are dropped into the bladder, you have a nice stop. You have a nice little fossa. The next step is extremely important. Once this adenoma has gone into the bladder, 
you need to do hemostasis as well as possible, as good as possible. You need to have an absolutely dry fossa before you start mosellation. That's the most difficult part of surgery. It is the easiest part as well as the difficult part. Mosellation uh, can be disastrous because when you're using a mosellator, it has got cutting blades in front. And if you have sucked the mucosa of the bladder into your mosellator, it can cut a nice little hole in the bladder and you can see small bowel. So you don't want to see that through the bladder, right? It's not a desirable thing to do. So requirement from before mosellation is number one, that you should have an absolutely dry feel. Your vision should be clear and uh, there should not be any bleeding. So you do hemostasis. And the second important thing is that somebody needs to be standing on your irrigation. Nobody can sit at the back and enjoy music uh, while the mosellation is going on. People have to stay. Both bottles should be running simultaneously of your glycine or normal saline. You don't really need to do glycine. And uh, it should be running simultaneously. Prolapses, you would suck the mucosa of the bladder into your mosellator and you cut. Energy spread. Defocused laser energy means that you do not pinpoint the laser. You be in that area and keep moving and spraying the laser energy in that area at, and with your uh, pedal halfway. And this way, you would be blanching those vessels. You will be coagulating the uh, capillaries rather than cutting. Otherwise, you can cut into the vessel. You can cut a vessel and it will start bleeding again. Right. So this is a little difference in the technique. This is your mosellator. This is the one that we use. In this mosellator, uh, uh, the important thing is that you have to change the resectoscope now. You can't use the same resectoscope for mosellation. Mosellator is a different scope. And this scope, the exchange has to be very quick. So you come out, you see, when you're doing uh, allic evacuation and uh, you evacuate the bladder, once you go again into the prostatic fossa, you find that there is again a lot of hemostasis or, or bleeding. Because prior to going into and like evacuating the chips, you had a dry feel, you go in and you come back and you find that there is significant uh, bleeding. And this is exactly what happens. If there is any delay bef before removal of your uh, laser resectoscope and introduction of a mosellator, then they would be feel bloody again and then uh, it's a disaster. So out and in. So you should be ready, ask your technician that is the mosellator resectoscope already and once it is then you remove the um, the, the resectoscope and reduce your mosellator now mosellation you've got a pedal and this pedal has suction as well as cutting so if you press it half it will be sucking and suction is done to attract the cotton ball lying in the bladder so once you start See, this is, all these are lying in the bladder. When you half press your pedal, it will attract that ball to come on tip of the mosellator. Once you have, once the connection is made, then you can press it full and it will start, the, the blades will start churning. And once the blades start churning, these mosellator will cut these cotton balls into small bits and pieces. Make sure that there is bladder wall above, bladder wall below and on sides and the bladder is full. You can also ask your assistant to keep a hand on the hypogastrium to make sure that the bladder is full throughout uh, during your mosellation process. Stop kidding. Is that clear? So three important things. Number one, very nice hemostasis, quick exchange of resectoscope for a mosellator. And third thing is that continuous two bags running simultaneously and somebody making sure, at least in the initial part of the surgery, that uh, the bladder is full all the time when you're doing mosellation. Now, sometimes you cut these things into really small, uh, medium-sized uh, pieces. And these medium pieces can neither be uh, mosellated 
and not they will come out through the alex so what you do is use a little special loop to attract these like you use your uh, uh, loop to take out some of the chips in the end which are difficult to evacuate so this is the mosellation process go close to the uh, to the adenoma engage and start cutting and those you need to touch the tissue uh, you need to you need to press it half and the tissue will come to you because this will activate the suction process once it start started suctioning it will suck the irrigation as well as the adenoma and adenoma comes and gets stuck to the tip of the mosellator once it is very close to the mosellator you can press it full and it will start churning because when you press it half no knife will be activated you will only be activating the suction process and sir what about uh, biopsy can we take it from oh these are these are nice for biopsy yeah because what you in turp you use most of the tissue is touched by a dithermy because you cut thin pieces slice of tissues now in laser you see we have used very little energy and we have used energy only on the peripheries the whole adenoma is untouched with laser or heat energy so this is a normal viable tissue and when you cut it you are actually cutting it with a cold knife you are not using hot because mosellator is not a hot current it's a cold knife it's just a rapidly churning it's just like your blender mixers that you have at home okay uh, nahi iske aakhir mein jaiye isme trilobar resection hoga just go to the last 2 or 3 minutes a 30 degree lens yes no no yeah so this is the uh, w uh, thing which it can be used for removing the small bits and pieces so these are difficult to mosellate uh, they can either be alec evacuate or you can use this to remove uh, now if you don't have a mosellator you don't want to use in the initial phase of the mosellator what you can do there are two things that can be done they can hold and remove all the shapes mushroom technique so you can cut a mushroom cutting a mushroom means that you when you are doing your adenoma you would cut all around but just leave a little stock of tissue on which the adenoma is sitting like this right so this is this is mushroom technique and this is still attached to the bladder as uh, still attached to the prostatic capsule you introduce your resectoscope and start cutting this is a totally devascularized tissue it's not going to bleed at all so you can use a resectoscope to uh, to do the last bits the second thing that is also described in literature is that for large adenomas once you have done and the, both these adenomas are there in the bladder you can make a little incision a cystostomy incision and take it out something that very few people practice but if you don't want to or you don't have a mosellator you can still do it this way okay now i think this is the trilobar uh, resection so there is a deep groove you see there's a deepish groove between the lateral lobes and the median lobe and to start off this type of uh, trilobar prostates you need to define the end of the median lobe and the beginning of the of the uh, vera montanum so you cut give a median to 5 and 7 o'clock incisions and then you cut transversely right in front of the uh, the vera montanum and uh, keep lifting this tissue up and this median lobe will uh, again nicely uh detach from the capsule and will fall into the bladder since there is very little adenomatous tissue here you you have to use more of your uh laser current rather than your uh blunt dissection so when you lifting it up you can actually define now all of a sudden you will see the black hole and that is the bladder once that is reach you would stop cutting and you will just push it so this way you are unlikely to do trigonal injuries and since your bladder neck is still defined on the two ends you know exactly 
when this adenoma median lobe is, is finishing. Okay, we'll stop here. And if there are any questions, otherwise we can move on to the to the simulator. Nazim simulator ko kar jab tak baat kar lete. Whole app laga do yar. Bailo bar. Whole app. Ha. Oh sorry, simulator. If there, are, if there are any questions from the audience uh, not at the AKU, please feel free to ask questions while we are setting up the whole app. Yes. So, would you recommend whole app for a small fibrous prostate? Well, that's not a typical indication. Unlike TURP, uh, even when you're doing TRP, it is not ideal to start with the small prostates. They're tricky. Uh, for whole app, the bigger the better. I mean, not huge prostate over 200 grams, but something like close to 100, between 80 to 120 grams are the ideal to start. They're the easiest because the boundaries are very well defined. Uh, for prostate, which are small, fibrous, less than 20 grams, kind of obstructing prostate, you're probably TUIP. Would suffice. <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's there must be uh, people. I one of a friend of mine who works in Europe told me that uh, he was he was able to cook the whole bladder, and he didn't realize until the second day after surgery that the whole bladder is fibrosed and it is uh, laser scarred. And it was in the end, it was only a 20 ml bladder for a normal bladder. That so all kind of complications. If you do not understand the anatomy and define the capsule nicely, you can keep digging it deeper and deeper, and you can reach anywhere. So I'm not aware of specifically, but it can happen potentially. Like even to URP people have gone into the rectum. Okay, so which one we want to, let's start with the 80 gram, okay, any volunteers? Hi, Afiz, you want to do it? Hi, so, where are they at? This is your <coughs> Now the key is that when you are holding your resectoscope this is the movement that you will be doing and when you are resecting so go there
Well, laser fiber, the principle is that you should be seeing the uh, green green covering or the blue covering of the laser fiber. And this is uh, for both your, your flexible urotroscopy and for this. Because although there is ceramic coating at the end of the resectoscope, but still you can burn your resectoscope. So now if you do like this, go in, go in and move your hand like this, you will be, if you move it, move it up, you will be able to see the capsule because what you're doing is using the receptor's code as your retractor. And when you move like this, you will be parting the median and the lateral lobes and you will be able to see this groove in the depth because what is happening is all this tissue is making that identification of the capsule difficult. Yeah, because 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 if you go in, go into the bladder, right, and now you use you use this moving up and down, you will be able to see the capsule. Yeah, it's, it's, it's because, yeah, I mean, start cutting from here, see the capsule in the bladder neck further, further. Unless we don't see the capsular fibers, we should hmm. not uh, go lateral. We should keep on uh, going deep. Yeah, you have to identify one plane and then uh, then move to another plane. So if, if you move from one plane to another without identifying the first plane, you would not know where to go. So identify the capsule first in the groove between the median and the lateral lobes and then lift it up. See, now this is the capsule here. You can see the circular fibers. So the cut of a of a expert resectionist versus the cut of a, somebody who is learning is like what you have read in jurisprudence that in order to identify whether it's a murder or it's a suicide, you look at the wound. If the wound is jagged, then it is suicide. So if it's a nice clean cut, it's a murder. So you would know whether it's you're doing a murder or you're doing a suicide. I think this one is a capsule now. Okay, fair enough. So now I think to learn the difficult part is to do the adenoma apex of the prostate. Now you need to see where you need to go. Now this is very important. Ye capsule again or ye capsule? Take it. So come back, huh? you've gone into the capsule. Take it. You don't need to go any further. This is a capsule now. Yes. One. Yeah, that's fine. Now come, keep coming back. Now you need to cut like this along. And to do this, you need to not only cut, but push. By pushing, you will be able to expose the space between the adenoma. Yes. Now, while you are cutting, you keep moving it like this and, and putting your scope between the adenoma and the capsule so that you are able to expose the adenoma, uh, the capsule. It's just like open surgery, like fraction. Yeah. 
So somebody is providing traction, they're actually describing the anatomical planes. And uh, then it's easy for you to go into that plane. Do a combination of blunt and uh, So you see, come back a little bit. Come back. Look, this groove is the sphincter. You see, the distal part of the verumontanum is, is finishing here. This is distal verumontanum. And this is the groove of the sphincter. Now, if you make a millimeter uh, 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 a mistake here, then you're cutting onto the sphincter. So you need to keep into this plane, keep lifting it up, and keep moving laterally. This is the most difficult part, and here you have done, you've gone deeper. You see? This is what Dr. Nazim was asking. Sometimes we see the apex of the prostate uh, is hanging the, over. Is hanging uh, beyond the. But the sphincter is still beyond the distal to the end of the prostate. So you once you have made that turn, that hockey stick is completed, then you push it medially and cut it. So you are moving away from the sphincter, uh, moving the adenoma away from the sphincter. So anyone else is interested? Are you? So now try without using your, see, a little bit of an extra uh, current has been used in the apex. What you needed to do is to use this to push the adenoma up and use your blunt rotating movements like this, like this to push the adenoma away from the capsule. Yeah. So if you put your hand on the top here, like this, it will be easier. Be very careful when you resect a new slither of mucosa that you are still in the right plane. So there is no harm in coming back, looking at that mucosal groove of the sphincter and the limits of the adenoma. So, this is my negative. I think you do green, green, other RNA. This is uh, extra heat energy used. Right. So, blunt movement ko kaise aap use karte. And then you can do it. I'll just take it for a second. So, you are in that plane. Now, what you need to do is to use ye movements right. to identify and I think what has happened is okay so yeah this this has to go and this and this and this 
and whenever you find little resistance you can use the cutting energy but by and large try and move it now there's some restriction here in the movement but uh, in patient you can easily move this adenoma so so ji sphincter aa gaya wahan pe likha hua nahi aayega ye dekhiye ye groove hai sphincter ki and i have touched that sphincter see ye le so ye movement se ye pura isme isme nahi ho raha kyunki isme thodi si restriction hai movement ki but that sweeping with the resectoscope what about the resectoscope which having the peaks which gives uh, some Uh, you know, help to pushing that you know there's a resector which having the two peaks the trp scope in the laser uh, i'm not uh, scenario uh, hmm. also have the touch feeling the what i tell yeah, yeah, yeah you so can there's uh, just a visual yeah Like this. Yeah, this is a sphincter, and you need to push it medially. Now, whenever you are in a difficult situation or you don't know where you are going, you move from one place to another. So you go in and do it a little more proximally. So I mean. Uh, in the meantime, when you are still uh, learning, or you still don't have that uh, uh, equipment available, you can use either your Collins knife, or you can use your uh, resectoscope to start cutting the apex of the prostate in this fashion, and learn how to do it in the real life. Uh, uh, and I find it very, very helpful. Uh, that uh, you get that feeling of cutting in the reverse fashion okay and uh, do it part of the procedure and then don't do your resection it's also helpful when you do it like this you will have little bit the problem with resectoscope is when you're cutting like this in a small space you develop a lot of air bubbles which obstruct your view so it becomes technically a little difficult but uh, Uh, which has which has full arch, lateral, so that is that is protruding while beyond the view. So how would you handle that? Uh, that was I was explaining to Atif that uh, once you have cut your blood neck, the most critical step is to take complete your hockey stick. So if you have cut your hockey stick in the right direction, in the right plane, then you are okay. Because once you have cut and made this turn, then you would use your resectoscope to lift the adenoma up. in lateral and start cutting and then you are away from the sphincter because the sphincter is here and the adenoma is moving medially towards the bladder or laterally or, or up so and this cut is very easy because you come to the verumontanum and you have to take a right turn or a left turn and hockey stick completed once you into that you have made that space then this space can be developed further by lifting adenoma up and then cutting so it's it's i mean this is cutting of the apex is slightly tricky but this is the uh, real art of doing this procedure we cut the apex also before we start the some people do that but that's not really required because uh, when you start cutting and you have gone all the way up towards the 12 o'clock position uh and you have to then move the whole adenoma from all directions up to 12 o'clock so it is only adhered with the anterior commissure so that's the point you cut and then you move medially a uh, laterally sorry so if you keep moving like this you would never know when you have crossed the midline <coughs> so because you are into that plane and you don't see that groove between the two lateral lobes so once you have done enough anteriorly and you think that there is very little tissue left because adenoma is mostly hanging that's the point you come back in size at the 12 o'clock position and then develop that 12 o'clock position to meet where you have cut up laterally so then you meet and 
abnormal will flop into the bag. Okay, any further questions, queries? Okay, we can wrap it up. Uh, any questions from the audience outside? If there is still some audience outside? So all of you feel it is doable in cases and then start doing it. How many of you do complete TURPs? Okay, so this is start doing until you get into laser, start doing uh, your TURPs, part of it at least in the reverse fashion. And uh, you will get the feeling. Once you get that feeling, then it's probably easier. OK, uh, I don't think there are any further questions. So really, thank you very much for being attentive audience and still awake, most of you at least, and not busy on your uh, phones, texting, or updating your Facebook status that I have attended the course. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so many more like this, and uh, you can even attend it in the luxury of your room. You see, the children were coming in and sitting in the bedroom and enjoying the little uh, seminar or webinar. So, and we'll thank you to the uh, sponsors, uh, Gets, for uh, making it possible. Confidence is the most important. Rajkumar. 
नरेंद्र लाल रेहान नासिर सलमान जमील कलीम खान कलीम खान भी फिफ्टी वन परसेंट सना सना हुसैन समझ में आया कल अगर आपको दे रहे किसको करेंगे मोहम्मद ओके थैंक यू वेरी मच बच्चों को तो मिला नहीं बैंक सर्टिफिकेट दीजिए क्या नाम बेटा आपका दो मारवी और
की मैं दो बंदा नहीं किया बस और ये देखिए ये है ना देखिए 